So everybody, as tradition holds, on every film, I don't even remember when this started with my pictures, but we started doing toast before we shoot the first shot, and we always do a toast just before the last shot. I have been dreading this day for 59 shooting days. I did not want this to end. I still do not want it to end. I have had the time of my life, literally, because this is a time of my life. And I have felt completely embraced and supported by all of you who knew what this film meant to myself and to Tony. We sat down October 2nd, 2020, and commenced writing the script after a 80, 90 page treatment. And then I called Christy up and I said, how soon can we make this movie? And Christy said what she always says, how soon do you want to make this movie? And I said, well, as soon as it's safe and as soon as we can get an enormously appropriate cast. And action. We were in Malta and we were filming in Munich and Stephen and I had known each other at that point only about eight or nine months. And I think I asked Stephen, when did you decide that you wanted, you know, the sort of thing you asked, when did you decide you wanted to be a movie director? And he told me the story that's the core of The Fablemans. It'll be our secret movie, just yours and mine. I heard the story and said, well, that's unbelievable. And then I said, Stephen, you've got to make a movie out of that. That's wild. And said, well, I've thought about it from time to time. And then I think we just started talking about it over the years. I really don't know what the perfect time would have been to tell this series of stories about my own recollections and recollections certainly of my, my family. But it helped that there was so little activity during COVID, especially in the all through 2020. I did a lot of thinking and a lot of walking around, watched a lot of movies, um, and I just didn't know. It was an uncertain time. And so I, I, I reflected, if I'm going to tell another story, and the story that I'm most familiar with, isn't this the right time to at least begin the process of writing it? Don't be scared. It'll be dark in there, you said. I don't want to go but in. But it's fun. All week you've been so excited, your first ever movie. We didn't want to make a movie that was for Stephen's very large fan club and his family and friends. We wanted to make a movie that reflected a human experience that's familiar to people who have had human experiences. That's sort of your ambition for everything you do. And something that would say something about life that we felt could be distilled from this pile of memories that Stephen had accumulated. And we knew that the structures of art are not the structures of life as it's actually lived. So we wanted to explore things that had actually happened to Stephen, but we wanted to give the audience, as well as Stephen, a kind of distance from autobiography. Family art. <laughs> It'll tear you in two. There's nothing in it that's wholly invented in terms of the events. Some of the sequencing has changed. There's condensation of time. There are some characters that are amalgamations of a couple of characters, but all the significant characters are based on people that did the things in Stephen's life that he shows them doing. Hey, keep the change. I would not have been able to co-author this film without somebody I truly admired and adored and knew me so well. And that happened to be Tony Kushner. And just because he won a Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award, been nominated several times for Academy Awards, for me, that wasn't a criteria. The only thing that mattered to me was I could open up to somebody and I would never feel embarrassed or ashamed and could actually go down a very personal road. And that's why I asked if Tony would co-author this with me. And we really co-wrote it. And I kept saying, oh, I'm writing a script with the guy that wrote Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. It was the most pleasurable writing experience I've ever had in my life. You see Monica and his family, it's the scientists versus the artists. Sammy's on my team, takes after me. I always say to Stephen, your family is not light on personality. Every single one of them is a one of. The sisters, but especially his mom and his dad. I mean, Leah was whimsical and fun and carefree. And Arnold was steady Eddie. He was just salt of the earth, straight kind and the most intelligent man. When I was a boy, I always used to think somebody figured out how to make this. Yeah. This car that 
rearview mirror, that directional signal? I want to make movies, though. I mean something real, not imaginary. The story kept tugging me back to actual memories and recreating things that had actually happened to me and seeing them unspool in front of me. It was a wicked weird experience, I have to tell you. It was just like nothing I have ever gone through before. That was great. And ultimately, it was a very good experience. It was really a great thing to have gone through, and I'm happy I did. And I cannot even imagine going through my career without having told this story. And probably at this time, so soon, two years after my father passed away and five years after my mom died. I think it was maybe part of his grieving process that he was able to work through the death of both of his parents and come up with this story that when I read it the first time, I was like, this is gonna be the most personal story Stephen's ever done. And I closed it and I was like, this is a story that every single person can relate to. And I knew at that moment that we were making the movie. I didn't know exactly when, and we ended up making it like four or five months after that first script was handed to me. Look back at the screen. I didn't want this story to be told in a vanity mirror. I wanted the story to be told in more of a communal mirror so people could see their own families inside the story. Because this story is about family, it's about parents, it's about siblings, it's about bullying, it's about the good and bad things that happen when you're growing up in a family that stays together until they're no longer together. Why is this all of a sudden happening? Stay together and probably half the kids in this country have experienced divorce. And so in a sense, I wanted this film to also be a reflection of different American families and to be able to remind all of us that we all have experiences similar to the Fablemans. <laughs> Some of the things are pretty crazy that happened to the Fablemans, but we're not just outliers. I think there's a lot to relate to. Sorry I'm late, I picked up Mrs. Fableman. Where should I put her? That was Steven, ya kazoo. I came up with the name Fablemans because I said we can't call it little Steven Spielberg and Arnold and Lee, it has to be other names. And Spielberg in German means play mountain. And in German, the fable is the outline that you make of a play and it's a fable. So Fableman seemed like a good nod to Spielberg. And I asked him to name all of the family members, and most of the first names were Stevens. Mm. Being on the ass, sisters. <laughs> That's rude. <laughs> he said ass. Tony and I didn't set about to make a comedy, but life is full of things that are ridiculous and silly and abstract and existential, and also very sad and traumatizing. And it's just what all of us go through as we go through our formative years. And I simply wanted this to be a coming of age story that takes stock in the stuff that happens to us that we wish never happened. And the stuff that happens to us which we look back on and laugh hysterically because it, it wasn't funny at the time. But in looking back, it was pretty funny. He's Jewish. You don't say. Yeah, I mean, since the day I was circumcised. I mean, I think part of the reason that we bonded when we were making Munich the way that we did is we both have a bone deep love of being Jewish and of Judaism and of Jews. So, you know, I think that was just a part of what the story was going to be. But the Fablemans are Jews, and it's not the point of the movie. There's no hiding of it. They're not trying to pretend that they're Christians. They're Jews. That's who they are. The aspects of my Jewish existence is just part of the DNA. It's, it's just that's how we grew up. And the bullying, it doesn't define me and it doesn't define my life, but it certainly is something that happened to me. <laughs> Nobody likes Jews. <laughs> Except other Jews, right? Less so in Arizona, but more so in Northern California. And the school bears no weight of culpability or responsibility at all. It was just two guys in my last year of high school. So I don't ever hold anything against the school. It was a fine high school. But I wanted to tell that story because it did result in a lot of my own awareness of anti-Semitism, which led to other films about anti-Semitism that I've made in my life. <sighs> What's going to happen now? I'm gonna be your mom, and I'm gonna be the girl's mom. One of the reasons I wrote this story is because 
at a very young age, something had happened in my life, which is reflected in our film, where I stopped perceiving my mother as a parent. I won't tell. And began looking upon her as a person. I won't tell, I won't. And I think all kids at a certain point in their lives, if they grow up in a communicative relationship with their parents, there are moments where they realize, hey, my parents have been people all this time and I never, I never knew it until now. And maybe the kid is 40 and the parents are 65. I had that epiphany when I was 16 years old. And so I've never looked at any of the people in my story as enemies. Because in a way, The Fablemans is a story about the act of forgiveness and how important that act of forgiveness is. Please, please, because how am I ever gonna forgive myself? I can't. Um, I, 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 I forgive you.